I guess he's going to talk about their trapped ion efforts and in particular quantum information processing in scalable microfabricated ion traps. Please, Peter. Now on. After Chris Monroe's great introduction on Monday in trapped ion quantum information, I can jump straight into the technical details and tell you about trap um, design and testing. So in trapped ion quantum information, if you want to go to from single chains of ions to big systems, you basically have two approaches. The one is uh, proposed in 2002 by Kilpinski, Monroe, and Weinland you basically, instead of a single chain, have multiple chains in a complex trap where you move ions around to move quantum information. There's a second level of scaling you can do, and I see the first thing as scaling within a chip and the second scaling to many chips. That is use remote entanglement, as demonstrated in Chris Monroe's group, to entangle ions in different chips and thus scale a quantum network beyond a single trap chip. Now, to make a trap that is complex to um, trap many chains of ions, you won't be able to do it with the traditional, let me take uh, macroscopic um, conductors and assemble an ion trap. You'll have to go to some microfabricated version of it. And while microfabrication enables big structures, long ion traps, it also has a number of challenges. Those are, for example, that you have now small distances to electrodes leading to higher anomalous heating. You have nearby di dielectrics to separate ion, uh, electrodes. And actually, you need to go to great lengths to remove near dielectrics from the line of sight of ions. You have small features. And let's say if physicists used to macroscopic ion traps are not to use to work in a dust-free environment. And but you also have more um, technical things like you have higher unharmonic contributions in surface traps that basically change the basic ion trap, pole trap um, physics where you assume that of a strictly harmonic potential. Now, in the last couple of years, we have worked on optimizing ion traps, microfabricated ion traps for quantum information processing. And if you look at current state of the art, experiments in quantum, in trapped ion quantum information, they're usually still using macroscopic traps. So one of our main driving forces was go and show that a, surf, a microfabricated surface trap is up that you can do state-of-the-art quantum information processing in those devices. And with the data I'll show, I hope that I convince you that we're about there. So <coughs> I'll start with our trap fabrication capabilities then go over our newest um, high optical access trap, and then go in characterizing quantum operations in that trap, first for single qubit gates, but then also for the much more important uh, monosodium and two qubit gates. Tra describing trap fabrication capabilities nicely has gotten very simple, because I can now say, dream up your ion trap, as long as uh, the electrodes are not too small, and too small is a couple of 10 microns is big enough, we can make whatever you dream up. So you can have islanded electrodes, you have, can, can have clusters of small electrodes, you can have uh, segmented electrodes close to the trapping location. And beyond that, on the skip sc uh, chip scale, due to the way um, chips are released from a wafer, you have more freedom beyond that. So you can basically, any mechanically stable shape for a trap will, can be made. Um, that means that in this case, we can make a narrow isthmus trap where improve optical access and uh, still have enough space for physical connections for a trap. Um, to make a trap scalable, in my opinion, you need two things, at least. One is a way of making a junction, so going from a 1D system to a 2D system. 
And here we have an example of a Y-shaped junction where those modulations go and prevent our pseudo-potential bumps from getting so big that you can't move ions through it. But there's also a second contribution that I think is important, that is getting from <coughs> regions where you have a slot, so this black region means there is simply a big slot underneath the ion trap where you can send in a beam, laser beam right on the ion and through the chip, and going from a region like that to a region above surface. Another important aspect is actually the, the simple connections and wires, like with the laptop here. Um, how do you package the device so you can distribute it to many groups? How do you get into the ideal Chris Monroe described in saying, we want ion traps and we want them all to be the same? An important thing there is parametric verification that a trap that's actually packaged in a uh, package that then is compatible with ion trapping groups around the world and making sure that the very device you're delivering is good so that it will trap if you don't, uh, if you do, don't make additional errors. Our latest trap is the high optical access trap and it's a Y-shaped or double Y-shaped um, trap so you can trap ions above this axis and above those side arms. And if you want to address ions, you come from the side and you have to hit your ion, but you don't want to hit the surface. Since the ions are only something like 60 to 100 micron above the surface, it's important to have a, the beam you will be using will have a radar length, or so should have a radar length that just matches the distance from the ion to the edge of the chip. So by making that this distance small, we can make, uh, enable you to make beams that have very good optical addressing. So you can, for example, at 370, you can send in a beam across the surface with a waste of four micron going through the slot, you can go down to two micron. So this trap was designed for good optical access, high trap frequencies, which is especially, especially important when you go to heavy ions like ytterbium. Full, and then as much control as you can get. Full control over your radial uh, principal axes. Um, and then segmented inner DC electrodes to give you the best access with DC control electrodes on making potentials along an ion chain. And so here are some more trap details. All scanning electron micrograph, you see the main trap, you see details of the junction, the transition here. Um, in this trap, we actually go and put electrodes on two different levels. So those inner DC electrodes are a metal level down from the outer electrodes. And this little going a little bit from 2D to, I don't know, 2.5D gives us advantages in trap depth and harmonicity of the actual trap. So now we have a trap and want to see how, what can we do with it in, in the lab. For one, we have the just classical properties. We get tra uh, in terbium, we get trap frequencies, 2.7 to 3 megahertz radially with uh, RF frequencies around 50 megahertz. It's stable for chains. Uh, we can see trapping times uh, well over 100 hours and uh, more than five minutes without cooling. So for a surface trap, those are pretty decent numbers. And we are doing most of our testing with ytterbium. We also have calcium, but what I'm showing here is uh, all ytterbium. You've seen that system before. In the 2S one half ground state, we have a hyperfine qubit with a clock state qubit. That means we get a coherence time of a couple of seconds without even doing anything. And we have easy means of preparating state, um, the zero state with very high fidelity, and then detecting whether we are in zero or one using standard fluorescence detection. And as was shown in, in Jonathan King's group, if you use a high numerical aperture lens to do so, you can realize that detection in about 10 microseconds and get um, state detection fidelity is above 99.9%. .9%.
So in characterizing a trap, one of the most important parts is what is the heating rate. So how much will anomalous heating disturb the motion of your trap? And um, so here we're looking at, and one other challenge in the iron trap is then to actually distinguishing uh, intrinsic noise from the trap from the technical noise you might have in your uh, DC control voltages and in your setup. So here we were characterizing the heating rates as a function of the principal axis rotation. That means in one experiment we characterize uh, using um, Rabi, um, Rabi oscillations and then pi times we characterize the direction of the principal axis and then along those directions we measure the heating rate. We see that we get um, parallel to the surface, we go down to 30 quanta a second and if we extrapolate to a perpendicular we get something like 125 quanta a second. Um, that show, uh, points out that we should have problems with some technical noise, but um, if you are using that trap, I assume you don't. And so you should be re realizing that uh, limit of something like 20, 30 quanta a second. Um, when the same trap has been um, used in uh, different labs and their heating rate measurements from Jones and Kim, which are pretty much exactly in this around 30 quanta a second. Uh, we have also measurements just measuring heating rate along the long linear section and we basically see it's, it's very homogeneous, it's 30 quanta from one end to the other end. Okay, now we have a qubit, we can hold it, we have heating rates that are acceptable. How can we go and look at um, qubit properties? And uh, having done randomized benchmarking before, I was really happy that when, once we got to the spot, we uh, went into collaboration with Robin bloom Kohut in how to really look at, how to calibrate and how to look at our gates. And in the data tomography he proposed, now you'll just get the kind of toned down experimentalist view couple of advantages, you don't need calibrations, you get, and the biggest advantage for me is you get detailed debug information, and I'll actually go and show you an example on how that can show you where you need to go to improve your gate. And detects non-Markovian no noise. So in contrast to randomized benchmarking, where you have a random sequence of gates that you analyze, they go and give me a sequence that's very ch well chosen to be yeah, as hard for me as possible. Namely, for any error that can be in the process, there is a sequence they give me that will amplify that error. And it's a tomography method, so we start with the preparation and the measurement by going into all six points on the block sphere or measuring in all six spaces. Then in between those, we get a number of uh, repeated short sequences called the germs. And those are the different constituent sequences that amplify all possible errors. So here, and so you do an experiment, you do that for many different sequences, you get your data, you put that into the algorithm, and you'll get a process um, infidelity, but you also get a diamond. And here we're looking at the diamond norm of our gates, x pi over two rotation, y pi over, pi over two rotation in identity, as a function of five different times we did the experiment while we improved the system. So we start up here, and in the end we end up in the couple of times 10 to the minus four uh, diamond norm. And I'll simply point out those points here and if you look at what we're actually doing here, you look at the identity, X and Y, you see that we want to do a pi over two rotation. But what it actually is, is a 0.501 pi rotation in both cases. And that is what the analysis showed should be the most of the error here. So those gates were microwave, single qubit gates, and the, we use BB1 to compensate for amplitude variation. And in BB1, you have a sequence of 
pi over 2 or pi 2 pi pi pulse, and that compensates for amplitude variation. However, if the pi has not twice the area than the pi over 2, and 2 pi not twice the area of pi, you get the uh, effect that if you take, and here's the example of a 9 compensated pi over 2 gate, and at the right time, you get the, as a function of the, basically the intensity, you get a flat derivative. However, that derivative is not at 0.5. And that is exactly a possible, uh, due to switching artifact, if the pi is not twice the area of the pi over 2, you still get the flat derivative, but not at the right state. So having seen that, we then said, OK, let's assume it's just switching artifact. Let's add an offset to each pulse, and then calibrate that offset. And indeed, so that's now for 101 and 103 gates. Those both, for an offset of 80 nanoseconds, those both cross at 50%. You do that, you get here. Now your pi over 2 gate is really 0.50000, 7 in the same pi. So you get very close to what you want to do. Sadly, our identity was still up there. Now, that gets me to the non-Markovian part. You have a lot of data on a system that you assume is a single qubit in a box. But is it really a single qubit in a box? So can, is that the right model for the data you're taking? And that's what's being plotted here. As a function of sequence length, what's the probability so how many standard deviations are you away from a, the, this model describing your, ex, uh, your system? That means if you're kind of, whatever, five standard deviations away, it's not a single qubit in a box. And we see that for our first data, yeah, we can do something like 10 or 100 uh, gates, but then it's pretty much done. And that gets me back to that identity gate. The identity gate here said it's a hundred pi rotation. But the identity gate is it's a clock state. We don't do anything. We just wait. However, we see here that we have problems with non-Markovianity. And what it turned out to be with some additional investigation is that if you do an identity gate and have your microwaves off, that will change the environment in your microwave amplifier generator and the following x or y gate is different and that looks to any analysis like the identity gate does something so once we went and <coughs> compensated that identity gate so it replaced a waiting identity with a identity that does an x pi pulse y pi pulse x pi pulse y pi pulse nominally that is dynamically decoupled but in my, so it looked like the most effect is simply that now the microwave duty cycle is constant. That gets us in a range where we can now do many thousands of gates and still be described by a single qubit in a box. So if we summarize those um, results, we get process infidelity 6, 7 times 10 to the minus 5. We get half diamond norms on the same range showing that we don't have problems with coherent errors here. And all of those are below uh, fault tolerance thresholds as uh, developed in this paper, showing that these single qubit gates would be below a rigorous fault tolerance threshold. Now, where are we limited in those gates? And there are two things. For one is the time resolution, and the other one is the coherence time. So it's 8,000 gates there. It's 1.66 seconds, which is about the coherence time of about a second, to which we are limited due to a uh, mediocre clock. Now to go to multi-qubit gates. And we're doing multi-qubit gates using Raman transitions, just like uh, the, um, the gates Chris Monroe described on Monday. We have the advantage that in Ethereum we have 355 nanometer light being 33 and 67 terahertz detuned from the excited state. So we're in a regime where the fundamental limits due to spontaneous emission are very small. 
and we use the optical frequency comb to address our qubit with 12.6 gigahertz. So in a two ion crystal, uh, we get, so looking at radio modes, we get two tilt modes, two center of mass modes. And we look at the center of mass mode with a heating rate of 60 quanta per second, and the tilt mode uh, has a heating rate below eight quanta per second. We can't really measure it, we just see, so eight quanta is a limit. So we take this low heating rate mode for driving the monosterns in two qubit case. And in our first experiment, we simply looked at um, population, so you start with zero, zero. The gate is supposed to get you from zero, zero to zero, zero plus one, one. You look at populations and then you add a pi over two pulse at the end and you look at parity oscillation. And from those you get the fidelity of the entangled state zero, zero plus one, one. And we improved the experiment and in a second set of data got somewhere where this simple estimate of an entangled state fidelity went from 97% to somewhere in the 99 plus percent range. But here that's the same problem, um, or even more than in single cubic gate case. You want to describe a process, but all we are looking at here, and all most people are doing, is simply saying, okay, let me start in zero, zero, and let me see how well I get to zero, zero plus one, one. So guided by Robin's uh, GSP, we have then been doing, so basic gates in our case is a homo uh, GXX, GYY, and the Momo Sorensen. All of those are symmetric between two ions, so we're in a symmetric subspace of the two qubit space. We have uh, preparation fiducials and detection fiducials, there are now more of them, and we have germs to the, um, run the sequences to amplify errors. And we do that and look at the normal Sorensen gate, and so here we have a um, process tomography matrix for the normal Sorensen gate that looks very close to ideal. And if you then look at the actual numbers, you see that the normal Sorensen gate is actually has an infidelity of 4.2 times 10 to the minus three. The um, X um, single cubic gates on both ends, global single cubic gates have a better identity as well, a better, fidel uh, better fidelity. You also see that the diamond norm here, there is quite a bit of discrepancy, almost a factor of 10 more, which clearly show, so you can interpret that as being bad or good. Um, bad, that is what you need to have good in the end. The good message is this simply shows that we are still mostly limited by coherent errors over under rotations um, classical control problems, and so should be working on those in order to increase the gate fidelity, or in other words, we haven't hit the limit of the trap yet. And all that is done in a scalable surface study. So with that, I'd like to conclude showing uh, capabilities in fabricating, designing single um, scalable surface traps, seeing long lifetimes, of ions in the trap, shown high fidelity single and two qubit gates, and I hope that with that we have actually convinced uh, many of those groups doing the cutting edge um, quantum information processing that they can go and adopt a surface trap and continue their great work therein. And thanks for your attention. for, uh, sorry, Peter, <laughs> <laughs> for presenting uh, those nice results. Uh, we have time for some discussion. Um, I would assume it's simply a heating question. So if, the, if you switch off the microwave, um, the temperature of the amplifier, so it's in, with a microwave horn, something like three watt output power, the switching has to be uh, before the amplifier. And my conjecture is that switching off the amplifier is 
switching off the microwave before the amplifier will just change the amplifier inside. If you switch it on, it has a slightly different power level. If we try to look at that uh, directly, mixing it down, putting it on a scope, but you're really looking at differences on the 10 to the minus 3, 4 level, and we are not able to see those directly. No, it's not random noise. It's, um, if you switch it, if you have the identity, the temperature of the amplifier changes. The next X or Y gate you do runs at a different power. So it's contextuality within a, a sequence of gates. It's not, I don't think it's random, but in the end, I need to control it in a way that the identity gate does not do anything. So with wall function sequence, if you see the um, momo sorensen gate in phase space of the harmonic oscillator, you're taking a superposition of, and you're moving that in phase space. And with that operation, you're going and adding up phase. And the key is that at the end of that operation, your uh, motional mode has not changed. So you don't leave um, quantum information in the motional mode. Now, in the lab, we tend to have uh, small control drifts. That means we're not controlling the power well enough, so after our gate, we're not quite where we are. Now, if we can now swip, um, swap the phase and do that backwards, then assuming slow drifts, you'll have a very good overlap. And that is what that Walsh compensation of the monosorms and gate does. One last question, Mark. The design principle or the problem that you would get if you do something um, <coughs> the problem what you get is so these electrodes outside are your radio frequency, el frequency electrodes you get an RF node above the center of those two now if you look at the end there's another radio uh, frequency electrode here and if you just make that as a symmetric uh, straight design, you'll get axial, uh, micro, uh, you'll get axial, axial chondromotive potential. So as you move here, you see more and more of that radio frequency electrode. And the axial chondromotive potential from that can actually exceed the trap depths if you don't uh, compensate for that. And now those wiggles here, those modulations, is what keeps the axial chondromotive potential at a low level, so you can actually shuttle an ion through those. Uh, regions. There are different approaches to junctions. Uh, for example, you can make a junction where you actually, it's more like the railway, where the railway you actually move the track. So where you have electrodes that, where you switch the radio frequency to actually, actually change the junction from one to the other. In this kind of junction, you only have one radio frequency and you use the DC electrode to move an ion through the structure. Stop here and thank Peter again. Okay, I'd like to make a few logistic announcements. The first one is, is concerning the afternoon meal, which we are used to uh, eating right about now. There should be boxes outside, so it's easy to get that food. Uh, in terms of sitting, we are fully allowed to eat anywhere in this conference room or outside. And in fact, we are sitting just like we used to have in grade school. There are actually little desks which come up. They may facilitate your, your lunch. So that's an easy way to do this. I would like to uh, rescind my initial proposal of cutting the lunch time. I think we should start at, at 1.30, which is with a 15-minute delay. We have quite some time in the discussion section, so I anticipate ending uh, precisely at the, at the right time. I would like to ask one important question at the moment uh, with regards to buses and transportation. How many of you anticipate using the shuttle at the end of the conference to go to the Doubletree Hotel? Let me see by show of hands. Okay, so I think one shuttle bus is sufficient. I don't think we need two shuttle buses. So at the end, the shuttle bus will come outside and take care of that. 
for those that wish to use the shuttle bus to go to the BART station at any time, the campus shuttle, which runs every 15 minutes, sorry, the LBL campus shuttle, if you like, which runs every 15 minutes, can rapidly take you down to the BART as you, as you need. The stop for that shuttle bus is maybe about 150 feet outside or, or what have you. There is a map where you can ask any one of us to point out where the blue shuttle, blue as in Azul, heading downhill will take you to the BART. With that being said, we will start precisely at 1.30 with the beautiful talk of Andreas Vahlrak. Thank you.